Today's scripture reading is the prophet Malachi, chapter 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither branch nor root. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out weeping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Dear friends, it is good to have you here. My name is Brandon. I get the privilege of being lead pastor here at Redemption. And let me tell you about some days that I've longed for in my life. Uh, Maybe you can identify with this. When I was younger, I certainly longed for the holiday season. Uh, I longed for it for many reasons. Beyond just the exchanging of gifts, my family would throw these huge parties. 40, 50 family members would gather around We would have amazing food. We would celebrate with laughter. We would play a family football game. I would be out of school, which I loved as a kid. I think about everything that made that time frame special. And I remember leading up to it, I would long for it. I would desire it. As I grew a little bit older, of course, there was other things that I longed for in my life. I longed for finding that girl, right? The one that I would uh, marry, the one that I would enter into a covenant with. And so I, I finally got the bravery on January 3rd, 2004. I got the date wrong in the first service. <laughs> Not now. She's in this one. I got the bravery to finally kiss this girl. And I knew immediately, I'm like, this is the one I'm going to spend the rest of my days with. Um, And so that was a beautiful moment, but I longed to meet her. And then when I did, it was fulfilled. And, And then I remember when we found out she was pregnant, of course, we didn't know how it happened, but we later would identify what led to the events of her being pregnant. But I I longed to see this child, you know, like bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Like I want to see this child that kind of bears my image in some ways. And so as she was pregnant and, you know, you see the little baby bump grow, you're like, I long for the day that I would set eyes on this child. But I've also longed for other things. I've longed for the healing of friends that are sick, I think about sweet Simone, who is a part of our congregation, and just longing over the last few years that, God, you would just do something great in her life and heal her. I've walked with very, uh, I've walked in very difficult situations and marriages, and just like longing, like, Lord, would you put it back together? Like, only you can do it, but would you put it back together? In moments of stress and anxiety, I've longed for peace. And I know I'm not alone because part of the human experience in a world that's broken and messed up is that we long for these moments where the world, at least for a moment, is as it should be. Like celebrating with family around the holidays and laughter and food. Like in some ways, there's this like echo into eternity. Like, Lord, I've been longing for this. And this moment is just a little glimpse of how things should be. And so we long for these moments where the world seems right, even if it's just for a moment. What I love about the ending of Malachi is he speaks into this deep longing we all have. Every single one of us, I don't care if you consider yourself religious or irreligious, you came in here and you long for things to be set right. And Malachi is going to speak to this. Now, remember, Malachi is a prophet from God. Literally, his name means messenger from God. He is the final messenger 
before the birth of Christ. So we're going to have 400 years of silence between what Malachi said to the people of Israel and then the birth of Christ. So for us, it's just a flip of the page, and we're in the New Testament. For Israel, they have 400 years of waiting Next week, we actually will flip the page and we will find ourselves in the Gospel of Matthew during the Christmas season. But remind yourself of where Malachi finds himself 400 years setting the table for the birth of Christ. Let me read the very beginning of this passage again. It says, For behold, the day is coming. And again, the ways that I've told you that I've longed for this, you've longed for this day as well. And again, if you are new to the faith or you're not even sure if you trust Jesus, there's this longing inside of you for the day to come. And maybe it's like pain, like, Lord, I long for the day when there is no more pain. It could be physical. As we get older, I realize my lower back is not the same as it was when I was in my 20s, now that I'm in my 40s. Like, Lord, I long to have a back that works like when I was 20. But then I know some of us have like really real physical elements that we're walking through. And we're walking through it right now and we're like, Lord, I wish this pain would stop. I'm longing for the day that I'm made whole. Some of us carry not just physical pain, but maybe it's emotional. Maybe there's some trauma in our past. And we're just longing for the day that things are made right, justice is served. We're longing to feel whole again, the pain to be removed. Maybe the pain of just broken relationships, like, Lord, please come. We long for no death, right? Especially in the holiday season. We're always keenly aware in these moments and in this season of who's not sitting at the table. And so we're longing like, Lord, I long to be with this person. I long to be with this person. I long for you to make things right. Death is not right. And so Lord, would you please come? Would you make it right? We long for relationships to be restored. Again, we're keenly aware of this in the holiday season of all the relationships that are broken and dysfunctional. Like one of our prayers has to be during the season, Lord, when they all come together, may there be no drama. Because we know family always comes with a little bit of drama because they're front row seats to each other's lives. We get to see our brokenness, and so we know things are not right. Marriages, we, we, we pray that, Lord, would, would, it, would there please be faithful spouses? Lord, would there please be a grace and forgiveness in marriages? We long for marriages to be made right. We long for, especially in this season, I, I think about the kids that don't have a family, like an orphan. And we long that, like, at some point you would, Lord, you would do what is right. You would put them in a home. Give them a mom and a dad or have their mom and a dad step up. We long for things like this. We long for, a, on a global level, like the world to be made right. There's no war. Like, Lord, would there be peace that rules and reigns on this earth? As Floridians, we long for the day there are no more hurricanes, right? So it doesn't matter who you are. You walk in here. I walk in here. And we have longings and desire, and we are waiting, whether we articulate it this way or not, we are waiting for that day, that day that things are made right. Now, here's what's really interesting. As we're waiting for that day, we have different thoughts on how we get there, right? Some of us think that like, okay, if the right government or candidate or political party is established, things will be made right. Now, listen, we do believe that policy matters because Policy affects people, and people matter. So I don't want to discredit the role of government, but that cannot be our ultimate hope. Why? We, we know even with uh, the perfect setup, the right leaders in place, government has an inability to change the hearts of people. 
So we can't put our ultimate hope that we'll, we'll arrive to this day if we just have the right people in leadership. It certainly can help, but it's not the full redemption we're longing for. Some of us sometimes put our hope in like education. If, if people just have the right information, if my husband just had the right information or my wife just had the right information or, or these people just had the right information, the right education, things will be whole and right. Now, by the way, giving to organizations that educate produces some of the best results we have in nonprofits. So I'm not discounting this at all. Matter of fact, we know with the higher the level of education, the better the economy and all likelihood, the longer lives are extended. So it's a good thing. But we know this as well. You and I, we know some of the right things and yet fail to live those right things out. Why? Because we know knowledge alone doesn't transform a heart. Sometimes we put our hope in, we'll, we'll arrive at this day if we just have all of these medical advances. We, we'll get there, we'll arrive there, things will be whole. And again, we love that medicine has advanced in such a way that life expectancy is at an all-time high, right, in our world. That's a good thing, that's a right thing. However, we know that we can have the right medicine and yet there's still orphans in the world. There's still broken relationships. Because all the solutions that we have apart from God for the day, they all lack to give us the full redemption we actually are longing for. And so please hear me. Those longings you have deep inside of you and deep inside of me, they are only fully fulfilled on the day that the Lord comes back. That's it. Like the foundational hope that we have, the primary and ultimate hope we have is that one day he comes back and he sets all things right. It doesn't mean we don't strive and fight for the right education. We strive and fight for the right medicine or or solutions from a government perspective. But we know that those are not our ultimate hope. No, our ultimate hope is this day. Now, here's what's really interesting about this day as we'll read here in a moment. Verse two calls this day, it's like the rising of the sun. Do you realize that the sun can be both a blessing and a curse? It's a blessing in the sense of without the sun, there is no life. I mean, literally, we need it to sustain life. Plants need it right? So they can go through the process of photosynthesis and ultimately uh, give us oxygen to breathe. We know that we need the warmth. I mean, us Floridians right now, we are begging God, may the sun break forth out of these clouds and not be so cold here, right? Because we're freezing. It's like 60 degrees. (laughs) It's a blessing. But we also know that the sun can be a curse, About a week and a half ago, I was at the dermatologist for my yearly checkup, examining my skin. Now, I was sitting in the doctor's office, and they had this scrolling screen of, you're at risk if, do you know the number one risk factor for skin cancer? Sun exposure. It's a blessing. We need it for life. But yet, if we get too much, if we have a severe sunburn, we're more likely to have cancer. It can be a blessing or a curse. It can scorch and it can give life. And so it is on this day that the Lord returns. It's both a blessing and a curse. So just want to talk about what will happen on the day of the Lord as outlined by Malachi. Let's read the full verse one. It says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. This is the the curse side of the coming of the Lord. The arrogant, those that say there is no God or there is no need of God. Those that say, hey, thanks, but no thanks to God. 
those that are actively involved in evil. This is the curse side of his coming. Now, what's really interesting, if you look at last week's message, sometimes we can look at those that don't follow the Lord, they don't fear his name, and go, they're prospering. That was a big struggle that the Israelites had. They were looking at those people that didn't follow Yahweh, and they're like, okay, these evildoers, these people that don't follow Yahweh, uh, they're successful in business. They're making money. It seems like they have a great life. I was on their Instagram, and they just posted this really cool food photo, right? And they're on all these vacations. It seems like life is going well for these people who don't follow the one true God. And so they're like, well, what profit do we have in actually following Yahweh? We might as well just just live and, and let Sundays be fun days and not even worry about the Lord at all. Just live our life. And I think there, for the prophet Malachi, he's revisiting this idea of saying, but there will be a day of reckoning. So from a temporal perspective, sometimes it doesn't make sense to follow Jesus. There's not a lot of logic to it. I mean, right, Jesus tells us to come and to die to self. Okay, so Jesus, you want me to pick up my cross daily and follow you. You want me to die to self. And I'm looking at these people over here who are living for self, and it seems like sometimes they have it better than me. And sometimes from a temporal, worldly perspective, that can absolutely be true. But from an eternal perspective... We understand that right now we live our life here on earth not for this life but for eternity because there will be a day of reckoning when he returns and this happens. It it uses language like burning like an oven, arrogant, and the evildoers will be stubble. The day is coming and shall set them ablaze, will leave them neither root nor branch. It seems like really harsh language. What is he getting at? And this is the curse side of the rising of the sun or the day of the Lord when he returns. That those that are arrogant and those that are evildoers will suffer much. Now, I grew up in kind of a fundamental like Baptist church. And so this was the weekly message, right? This is the weekly message, the hell, fire, and brimstone And then what's interesting, you go to to what culture says about this, and culture swings wildly the other way. So this is like fear, I want you to trust Jesus, because you do not want to go to hell. And then over here, we got like ACDC, you know, saying, I'm on a highway to hell. Come on, everybody, join me. The worship team should allow me on stage a little bit more before the message. But what we read in Scripture is on the day of the Lord, there is a reckoning that happens, and it is awful. The first thing that we see is we see that the Lord will send away those who reject him. I mean, he will send them away. Jesus said it this way, There's going to be people that I don't know, and I'm going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. So the the giver of life will actually send people away for eternity. Malachi is using very, uh, he's using imagery to explain how difficult this is. I think when you read this, I'm not sure we read it literal. I think we read it as, what is he trying to convey symbolically? We certainly conveying that the giver of life where we flourish is the opposite of stubble and burning in an oven, like this eternal death. And we know that the Lord will send them away from his presence. I love what C.S. Lewis famously said. He said um, uh, that, that God will one day say to these people, either thy will well, uh, thy will be done, or God will say to them, thy will be done. So we're either going to say, Lord, thy will be done, or the Lord will say to evildoers or the arrogant, thy will be done. And they've rejected him on earth, and he gives them what they wanted for all of eternity. 
I also think he is clearly communicating Malachi, just the anguish and regret that the evil evil doers will have. Jesus, a lot of people are like, oh, Jesus was just so nice and kind. And yes, he was those things, but he also had very straightforward words about this day. Listen to what he says in Matthew 13, 49 and 50. He says, so it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. A lot of the depictions we have of hell is, you know, fire, anguish. Now, I'm not exactly sure if in hell there will actually be fire. Well, I don't know that because Jesus was telling a parable and he said it this way in Matthew twenty-two thirteen, 13, talking about the afterlife, talking about those that will spend eternity apart from him. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So wait, is there fire or is there darkness? Like fire produces light, Right? Well, again, I think Jesus is using imagery just like Malachi saying, hey, listen, it will be awful. There will be anguish. Evildoers will have regret from what has happened. Now, of course, this is the curse side of that day. But we also know that there's a blessing when the Lord returns. See, I... I've only heard, honestly, growing up, kind of that side of things. But also, when you look at Malachi, he's saying, wait, wait, what's the blessing of his returning? And again, I think it speaks to these deep longings you and I have. Listen to what he says in verse 2 of Malachi chapter 4. He says, but for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings, and you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. I love this picture. He just painted a picture of, listen, on the day that he comes back, if you said, thanks, but no, thanks, God, it will be very difficult for you. There will be anguish. But if you fear the name of the Lord, and for us, if we've trusted in Jesus, there will be great blessing. And the first term he uses is there's going to be healing, right? The people of God will experience healing and joy. Think about, again, all the ways that we desired to be healed. Physically, we desired to be healed. On that day, the Lord heals us. Think about the ways that we want to heal from a heart perspective. I think about how broken my heart is and how many times I have to repent every day. And, 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 and God will completely and fully heal my heart. Think about the relationships that are long to be healed fully and completely. God brings great healing. So these longings you and I have inside of us. He goes, the day that I return, I'm going to heal you. And then he said, there's going to be great joy. Now, if you put a calf in a stall all night, a young, vibrant calf, and then in the morning you open up that stall door. I mean, it's going to jump out with joy. There's freedom there. He goes, that's what it's going to be like for my people. They're going to experience healing, and they're going to leap like a calf that has been stuck inside all night, and there's going to be great joy. You know, I love watching sports and there's times where something happens and you're just like, yeah, like, and you just jump with excitement and joy. Uh, I think about one time, uh, Braden, our 14 year old, he was playing in a football game and I was his coach and it's going down to the final seconds. There's like 10 seconds since the running clock. And we're like, you got to hike it. You got to hike it. Everybody's screaming and yelling. The fans are going crazy. And we're like 50 yards away and he fakes it, and then he runs down, and he gets into the touchdown, he scores, and like, he sees my wife, Heather, and they like jump together, and people are crying, and I'm running around like a hoodlum on the field, pumping my fist, yelling at the other parents, no, no, I didn't, I didn't say anything like that. 
But like joy had consumed me in that moment. That like physically I could no longer restrain myself. When the Lord comes and his people experience healing in the fullest sense, that's how we'll respond. Complete and utter joy, unable to restrain ourselves because of the joy that we are experiencing. The day of the Lord is the day that, again, all of us long for. You, you came in here maybe today and you're like, I don't know where I fall in with Jesus. Or maybe you've been following him for a long time. You long for this day that all things are made right, full and complete restoration. You long to be on the blessing side of this day. And that's why the Bible calls us to repent and to turn to him in faith. Because the Lord wants to grant us this blessing of this day. Now, the question is, so what do we do in the in-between? So here we sit. We're longing and looking for this day to happen. How do we live right here and right now? Well, they're asking the same questions, so he gives them a couple ways to live. The first, verse four, is just simply obey his commandments. He says this in verse four. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and the rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. He literally goes, I know what you're asking. You're longing for this day to come. You're all longing for it. So how do you live right now? Well, remember Moses. Remember God gave you his law. It's his template for how to live. See, a lot of us think God is a cosmic killjoy that if I follow him, then I got to follow all of these rules and regulations. But really what we find is it's his rules, it's his laws that actually grant us freedom in our life. That the best possible way to live is to follow the creator of life and how he's designed it to be lived. So he goes, follow me. Again, they're, they're in this weird spot. They're looking at everybody else and they're going, "Ah, they're profiting, we're not profiting, should we even follow God? They're questioning everything from a temporal sense. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to not uh, not be like those people over there. He goes, hey, listen, I, I know in a messed up, imperfect world, you're gonna have questions. You're gonna have doubts. You're going to look at this and go, that's messed up. What do I do? And he goes, and just trust me. See, obedience is just really an outworking of trust. That I'm trusting him with my life. So even when life doesn't make sense, and I look over the fence, and I'm like, it doesn't make sense, Lord. It's not fair. He's like, just trust me. Just trust me. You long for this day, and it is coming. Trust me and obey me. One of the best prayers that you can pray is this, Lord, the answer is yes. What is it? Just prayers of obedience. Lord, whatever you want from me, I am willing to give it all to you and say yes. Next, he also encourages them this way, verse five. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So he's telling them first, obey me. Remember the law. Follow me. Even when it doesn't make sense, trust me, the day's coming. But then he also says, and I want you to look forward to another day. And this day comes before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, often what we read is Elijah, or the prophecy of this coming Elijah in the New Testament is often referring to John the Baptist. And that could be the case here, but reading some commentaries this week, I actually think that what he is referring to right here is the great and awesome day that Jesus is born. See, Elijah was this prophet 
And I think what he's saying is, I, I, I want to point you to Jesus, the ultimate prophet. And he's coming before the great and awesome day. He's coming. I'm going to be silent for 400 years. But he is coming. And in the waiting, you have to trust me. And so for us too, I, I believe, what do we do in the meantime? We obey him and we're constantly setting our gaze on King Jesus. Jesus has our attention. He has our heart. We are looking to him with our concerns, with our doubts, with our questions. Hey, by the way, God is big enough to handle our questions that we have and concerns and the doubts we have. And so he says, hey, look to me. Now, as we come to a close, I just want to say this. The Christian life is a life of waiting especially as we enter into the Advent season, it is a life of waiting. You're like, what do you mean? Well, these people are waiting on the great day of the Lord. They're also waiting on the Messiah. He's like, he's coming, and the great day is coming. They're awaiting people. And here we are. The Messiah has already come, and we're waiting on the great day. We don't know when that will be. We don't know what it, exactly that's going to look like, but we are fully trusting the King Jesus is returning. They were waiting for his first coming. We are waiting for his second coming. And so we are these weird, odd people that live as aliens in a land like this, knowing that this is not our one true home. And so we live very, very differently because we know he is returning. And that for us changes everything. And when we see brokenness in the world, here's a great cry that we can have. Come, Lord Jesus, come. John, after receiving a vision of what it will be like, the new heaven, new earth, when he comes again, he proclaims, come, Lord Jesus, come. What you have just shown me, that's what I want. And here we are sitting here 2,000 years later saying, Lord, Lord Jesus, come, come. We need you.